So let's then return to what is actually going on in the human body. What do we know about diabetes physiology? I've said insulin resistance. What is insulin resistance? It's when the cells, generally we're talking about cells, muscles or liver, or could be fat cells, could be brain, could be the whole body, refuses to respond to the signals of insulin. Why does that happen? It's complicated physiology, but I think anyone who really understands this deeply will agree that insulin resistance physiology starts in the fat cell, the adipocyte. It starts with broken fat cells. Again, look at the podcast on how to lose weight for a deeper dive here, but broken fat cells that cannot divide, that are forced to expand, to become distended and become inflamed, are at the root of insulin resistance that is diabetic, that is metabolic syndrome, that is metabolic dysfunction physiology. That's something I've discussed many, many times. Broken fat cells. There are two things a fat cell can do as you try to stuff more nutrients into it. It can balloon or it can divide. Those are respectively hypertrophy or hyperplasia. Adipocytes in diabetic physiology appear to have broken hyperplasia. They cannot divide. They can only expand. They can only hypertrophy. And what appears to happen is as these fat cells expand, they become distended, they release inflammatory mediators, they release lipokines, they become resistant to the signals of insulin, and they start releasing free fatty acids all of the time. We know that people with pre-diabetic physiology or diabetic physiology have higher levels of free fatty acids in the blood. Those are also called non-esterified fatty acids. And those fatty acids in the blood signal to the muscles and signal to the liver to become insulin resistant. We get into some nuance here because when you are in a ketogenic state, when you are fasting, you will also have higher levels of non-esterified fatty acids because the fat cells will be releasing those free fatty acids into the blood. And you do get something called physiologic insulin resistance at the level of the muscles primarily, but also that can happen at the level of the liver. But the difference is that insulin levels are low in that state. And if you return carbohydrates to the system, you will regain insulin sensitivity. This is a physiologic adaptation to starvation or ketogenic diets or low carbohydrate diets that allows us to spare glucose for red blood cells, testicles, adrenals, brain, et cetera. So it's normal physiology to have physiologic insulin resistance. Pathologic insulin resistance happens when you have high levels of insulin. The body is trying to signal to the fat cells, to the muscle cells, to the liver, to take up glucose and to take up free fatty acids, to take up energy currency, but those tissues are refusing that because the fat cells are broken and they are sending out all sorts of signals to the body to refuse the actions of insulin. So then we come back to the position where we must ask what causes broken fat cells? I'm glad you asked. There's pretty good evidence that HNE, 4-hydroxynonanol, the breakdown product of linoleic acid, is a major culprit in what causes broken fat cells. I'm not quite sure why this isn't discussed more in Western medicine, but articles like this, I think, are critical and help bridge the gap between what we see in a research lab and what happens in a clinical setting. The title of this study from Free Radical Research from 2013 is The Role of Physiological Levels of 4-Hydroxynonanol on Adipocyte Biology, <laughs> Implications for Obesity and the Metabolic Syndrome. So this is done in cell culture, and what they found was that our studies demonstrate that acute and repeated exposure of adipocytes, fat cells, with physiologically low concentrations of HNE, a toxic aldehyde from the breakdown of linoleic acid, are sufficient to promote subsequent oxidative stress, impaired adipogenesis, that is the hyperplasia that I was talking about, alter the expression of adipokines and increase lipolytic gene expression and increase free fatty acid release. So they go on to say these results provide an insight into the role of HNE-induced oxidative stress in the regulation of adipocyte differentiation and adipocyte and adipose dysfunction. Taken together, these data indicate a potential role for HNE promoting diverse effects toward adipocyte homeostasis and adipocyte differentiation, which may be important to the pathogenesis observed in obesity and metabolic syndrome. Basically what they're saying is that HNE causes impaired adipogenesis. HNE does not allow the fat cells to divide. That leads to hypertrophy and broken fat cells. One more study that shows the exact same thing. The title of this study is 4-hydroxynonanol. That's HNE. Causes impairment of human subcutaneous adipogenesis and induction of adipocyte insulin resistance. That is the beginning of insulin resistance systemically. Again, where does H&E come from? The formation of toxic alpha-beta unsaturated 4-hydroxyaldehydes like H&E 
in thermally oxidized fatty acid methyl esters. If you look at the study, there's a lot of complicated organic chemistry, but the takeaway from this study is that HNE comes almost exclusively from the breakdown of linoleic acid in the human body or outside of the human body, as we saw in the studies looking at French fries. The very concerning hypothesis here would be that HNE, which impairs adipocyte differentiation, adipocyte hyperplasia, causes adipocytes of hypertrophy, causes oxidative stress, upregulates lipolytic gene expression, increases free fatty acids, leads to broken fat cells and insulin resistance, that compound comes from linoleic acid in the human body or outside of the human body if it's in a high linoleic acid oil that is being heated. Where does linoleic acid come from in the human body? It comes from what we eat. We don't make any linoleic acid in the human body. That's why it's considered, quote, essential. But I think that the levels needed for optimal human physiology are much lower than what we consider today, that you basically could not avoid getting linoleic acid in your diet. This is one of the reasons I'm such a fan of things like tallow or ghee or butter. They are animal fats with two to 3% linoleic acid in them relative to higher levels of linoleic acid in things like olive, avocado, or increasing to canola, cottonseed, soybean, et cetera. So you can look at the continuum of levels of linoleic acid in these oils. And I try personally to avoid any oil with larger amounts than two to 3% of linoleic acid in my diet. Egg yolks have more linoleic acid than that, but I don't use olive oil for that reason. Is olive oil going to be a problem for most of you? Probably not, but I think you would be better served by doing things like tallow or ghee or butter to get those levels of linoleic acid down more in your diet, especially depending on what your baseline level of linoleic acid in your fat cells and your adipocytes are and what your insulin sensitivity is. Now let's pause here for one moment. One thing that I didn't mention early in the podcast was that I believe that fasting insulin levels should be used to diagnose diabetes. And if these were drawn more, we would see a massive increase in the diagnosis and treatment of prediabetes and diabetes. Looking at population levels of fasting insulin in Americans, the average fasting insulin for men is 8.8 .8 micro IU per ml. The average fasting insulin for women is 8.4 micro IU per ml. If you look on a lab study, the reference range for fasting insulin goes to 15 or sometimes 20 micro IU per ml before it gets flagged. To me, that is abysmal. And that single oversight in the reference range is why we are missing prediabetes. Consider the fact that the average American fasting insulin is 8.6 micro IU per ml. And then consider that 87.8% .8 of Americans have at least one indicator of the metabolic syndrome and realize that 8.6 micro IU per ml is probably much too high for most people. Every time that I've checked my fasting insulin, and I've shown this in my blood work multiple times, July, August of 2022, most recently I did two sets of labs, my fasting insulin is three micro IU per ml or lower. You can also look at a C-peptide if you want, but they tend to correlate very closely. I have low fasting levels of blood glucose, low hemoglobin A1C. You can go back to the blood work podcast if you want to see my labs. So when I am eating a diet that is animal-based, meat and organs, I get my organs fresh or from heart and soil supplements. The desiccated organs there are much easier for many people than the fresh organs. I take whole package and beef organs mostly on a daily basis. And I'm getting fruit, lots of fruit, honey, raw milk. This is an animal-based diet. I'm eating lots of saturated fat and my fasting insulin with carbohydrates often greater than 200 grams per day are less than three micro IU per ml. So if red meat, if saturated fat is causing diabetes, why am I not insulin resistant? It's just an anecdote, but it's an interesting experimental vessel. If fruit and carbohydrates are causing insulin resistance, regardless of the source, then why am I not insulin resistant? So this all goes to say that I think that if you change your diet, your fasting insulin will go down, know what your fasting insulin is, and that should be the metric that most of us are looking at to know when we're diabetic, when we're pre-diabetic. My sister actually told me about her mother-in-law who was recently diagnosed as pre-diabetic. This is a woman who thinks a lot about her health, eats low fat, eats lots of grains, avoids red meat, uses oil on her salads very frequently, olive oil, probably some vegetable oil mixed in there. Her hemoglobin A1C was 5.9. The doctors didn't even check a fasting insulin, but I'm betting her fasting insulin would insulin would have been eight or nine. They diagnosed her as pre-diabetic and recommended drugs. <laughs> they recommended metformin. They didn't even consider asking her about other dietary changes. They didn't consider cutting carbohydrates, changing grains, looking at sugars, 
She doesn't eat many of those. They didn't consider changing oils in her diet. Clearly something is wrong. Something is badly broken with the way we are diagnosing and thinking about insulin resistance, about diabetes in the Western medicine population. 